And so I'm going to start today's message with a glimpse into eternity past, before the creation account in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. Satan and his angels were the first to sin against God. This happened before the Garden of Eden. Satan and his angels were cast down at the first sign of rebellion without an opportunity for redemption. Their fate was sealed and hell and all of its torments were prepared for them. If you want to follow along, I'm going to read from the book of Ezekiel chapter 28 beginning in verse 12. Ezekiel 28, verse 12. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the ruby, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the lapis lazuli, the turquoise, and the emerald, and the gold, the workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You are the anointed cherub who covers. And I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane, from the mountain of God. And I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings that they may see you. Second account that I want to look at is in Isaiah 14. If you want to follow along, it's going to be in verse 12. Isaiah 14, 12. This will be familiar to you. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds I will make myself like the Most High. Nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. So we know that these passages were speaking directly to the king of Tyre and, and the king of Babylon. But these words of the Lord also went beyond these men to the devil who was influencing them. Revelation 12:19 describes the angels who fell with Satan. I'll just read it. It's Revelation 12:19. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old who was called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. If you want to turn to Matthew chapter 25, I'm going to read a pretty lengthy uh, portion of that. Matthew 25 verses 31 Two forty six. This passage explains that hell was prepared for Satan and his angels. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left then the king will come to those well, th then the king will say to those on his right 
Come you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. And then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And then they, then they themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to, to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. God has chosen that Satan and the rebellious angels shall have no opportunity for redemption, no hope of salvation. They were instantly thrown out of heaven to await their eternal torment in hell. Sometime after this heavenly mutiny, God chose to create the world and all that is in it. God chose to create man. God chose to create man in his image. God chose man to be the crown of his creation, and God chose that man would be able to communicate with him unlike that of any other creature. To have a special fellowship with the creator. God chose to place man in the Garden of Eden. God chose to give the man free reign over the garden to eat freely of any tree in the garden, any tree but one. God chose to give the man a command, you may eat freely from any tree, but not that one tree that is in the middle of the garden. And the man ate. And God chose that death was the result of that one sin. Sin entered the world and death entered through sin. But God chose a redeemer. God chose to foreshadow that redeemer in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. This has been called by some the first gospel. So Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, it says this, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. God chose to have regard for the offering of Cain, but God chose to have no regard for the offering. Let me say that the other way. God chose to have regard for the offering of Abel, but God chose to have no regard for the offering of Cain. God chose to blot out man from the face of the earth because he saw that every intent of the thought of man's heart was only evil continually. God chose to save the family of Noah only eight individuals out of an untold number of people. God chose to promise that the earth would never again be destroyed by water. God chose to put the rainbow in the sky as a promise. Later, once the earth had been repopulated, God chose to confuse the language of every person, to scatter men all, all over throughout the whole earth at the Tower of Babel, God chose Abram and told him to leave his country and to leave his kindred and to leave his father's household and to go to the land that he would show him. God chose to make him a great nation. God chose to make his name great 
And God chose to bless those that bless him and curse those that cursed him. God chose to establish a covenant with Abraham. God chose to multiply his descendants exceedingly and to make him a father of many nations. And God chose to change his name to Abraham and to change his wife Sarai's name to Sarah. And God chose to bless them with a son when they were both nearly 100 years old. God chose to test the faith of Abraham with the offering of Isaac. God chose to spare Isaac and provide the offering himself with a ram caught by the horns in the thicket. God chose between the children of Isaac. God chose to love Jacob, and God chose to appoint him to divine blessing and protection, and God chose to to hate Esau, and God chose to leave him to divine judgment. God chose Jacob to be renamed Israel. God chose Joseph, the son of Jacob, who was sold into slavery by his brothers and later in prison for a crime that he didn't commit. God chose to raise Joseph up over the land of Egypt. Later, God chose Moses to be spared from the new Pharaoh's command to throw all of the Hebrew baby boys into the Nile River. God chose Moses to confront Pharaoh. God chose Moses to lead the Israelites out of captivity. God chose Moses to receive the Ten Commandments. God chose Joshua to be the successor of Moses and to lead Israel into the promised land. God chose to have the army of the Israelites march around the city of Jericho every day for six days. And then on the seventh day, march around the city seven times and have the priests make a long blast from the ram's horns and have the people give a mighty shout and for the wall of the city to collapse. God chose Samson to deliver the Israelites from the hand of the Philistines. God chose David to kill Goliath and then later to be king over Israel. God chose Solomon. God chose Elijah and Elisha. God chose the prophets to declare that sin and judgment has come upon all of mankind. And God chose the prophets to foretell in detail the coming of the great Messiah and the glorious redemptive plan of God. God chose his son to be this wonderful Messiah. God chose Jesus to be the Christ. God chose a virgin named Mary to give birth to the Lamb of God. God chose the disciples. Even Judas, who was the son of perdition, was chosen to fulfill the prophecy of Psalm 41, verse 9. It says this, Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. God chose Saul of Tarsus, who was filled with murderous hatred of all believers and was ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women so that he could throw them into prison. So let's look at the account of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus in Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told to you what you must do. One of the tasks that this this man Saul, who was also known as Paul, was tasked with, was writing the church 
was writing the letter to the church at Ephesus. So if you'll please take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to our text for today, which is Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to read the first 10 verses, and then we'll pray. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Let's pray. Father, you have called us out of death and into your marvelous light. We who were your enemies, following after the course of the world and deserving of your wrath, you, you have given us life in Christ. By your grace, you poured your wrath that was due to us upon your precious Son and have determined to pour your love and mercy upon us in Christ. Father, bless the, bless, bless the preaching of your word, Lord. Help me. Bless the minds and the hearts of your people. Meet with us now, Lord. We pray in the name of your precious Son and for his sake. Amen. The sovereign choosing by God, as he has ordained the events of mankind throughout history from the beginning of time until the end of time. This is also known as the doctrine of election. There are different categories of election. God has chosen certain people either to an office or to a specific task of service. God chose people for leadership over the nation of Israel, such as Moses, King David, and Solomon. God chose the tribe of Levi for the priestly ministry to Israel. There's also a corporate election or the choosing of certain nations or groups of people to enjoy special privileges or to perform unique services to God. God has set his electing love upon Israel to be his special possession among all the nations of the earth. And God has chosen particular individuals for salvation. Admittedly, this is a controversial doctrine. But Scripture is clear, and we must, as we endeavor to be faithful to the clear teaching of Scripture, we must consider what God has said. The sovereign election of God, by which he has infallibly determined all that comes to pass, according to which he works all things, as we read in Ephesians 1, Going back to Ephesians 1, 4 to 5, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. And Ephesians 1, verse 11, also we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. 
why do we embrace this doctrine? We read it in Ephesians, verse 12 of chapter 1, 112. To the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. We are going to give praise and honor and glory to the one who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. We are going to see God for who he is and we're going to see man for who he is. And God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. The only thing that we contributed was the sin for which Christ died. Let me say that again. The only thing that a sinner contributes to his salvation is the sin itself. So, to our text for today, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So right off the bat, Paul is pulling no punches. He's making it clear that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, as we talked about last week. Man in his natural state, the state that we are born in, is a spiritual corpse and is utterly unable to respond to the external call of the gospel. I said this last week. So the external call of the gospel, this is what ought to go out to the masses during every evangelistic attempt. When we beg every man man that hears it, we plead with them. Anyone that can hear our message, come to Christ for salvation, repent, place your faith in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ so that you might be saved. The theological word for the state of mankind being unable to respond to that external call is depravity. Natural man is totally depraved. Now that doesn't mean that every man is as bad as he could possibly be. But it does mean that every man has violated the law of God and has no capacity in and of himself to please God or to settle the balance of the debt that his countless sins have incurred. All men have fallen short of the glory of God. It's our nature which is sinful, which is sinful that has caused our spiritual death. Now let's remember that the book of Ephesians was written to the saints at Ephesus who were faithful in Christ Jesus. Each of them were just like each of us here today, having formerly walked according to the course of the world which is governed by Satan, who is here referred to as the prince of the power of the air. And it is he and his system that is working in every person who is outside of Christ. Every person who is referred to here as a son of disobedience. A son of disobedience will have no regard for the word of God and no regard for the will of God and will be a slave of sin. Romans 6, 16 says this, do you not know that when you presented yourselves to when, that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience you are slaves of the one whom you obey either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness So now Paul his goal here is not to focus on how unsaved people are living their lives His goal in this text is to focus is to bring to our remembrance the fact that we too were once just as they are. We were outside of Christ, chasing after various lusts, which don't necessarily have to be sexual in nature, but we lived our lives and we spent our days our way, doing whatever felt good to us and had no inclination towards the glory of God. This is the natural state of all mankind. And they are storing up for themselves wrath for the day of wrath. And we ourselves were the children of wrath as the rest. Verses 4 and 5 of our text. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. But God. 
these two words alone could make a sermon. Who is this God? First of all, God is sovereign. That is to say that he is in total control of his creation. Nothing occurs without his permission. God has never learned anything. God has never been surprised by anything. What God has ordained from the beginning shall come to pass. God is holy, and as a holy God, he cannot be indifferent to sin. It is because of his opposition to everything that is sinful that his great plan of salvation was devised in eternity past and is being, ex- is, and is being executed in time. Every sin will be punished. God is full of wrath against sin because God is holy. Wrath is the outworking of his holiness against all that is opposed to it. And this is the great terror of being dead in trespasses and sins. It is not as though God and mankind can just go along merrily on their separate paths. God does not simply take his own path because he is sovereign and because this is his universe. Every sin that has ever been committed will be punished. Sin will either be punished in Christ or sin will be punished in the sinner himself. Beloved, here's where the beauty of the gospel can be seen. While we were dead in our transgressions, hopelessly lost in wickedness and simply waiting for the great day of judgment. God himself intervened to save, to save us. He saved us sovereignly. God himself has made us alive with Christ. The reason that we look at the great doctrines of Scripture is so that we may better understand who God is. And in his sovereignty, God in his sovereignty has set his love upon a chosen people. And through the life of and death, and resurrection of his son, he has redeemed them. Those who were dead men walking and storing up wrath for ourselves have been given new life. He is rich in mercy towards those who are in Christ. Mercy is being spared from a punishment that is just and deserved. So I've heard some reject the doctrine of election, saying that it's, it's not fair for God to choose some for salvation and then pass over the rest. Beloved, fair would have been for Christ to stay in heaven with the Father and to never leave the constant worship of the holy angels. And for all of us here, you and I, to have our share in the cup of God's wrath. We don't want fair. We want mercy. But because of the great love that he had for us. Now, why did he love us? It's been well stated that God certainly must have chosen me before I was born. For there has been nothing that has occurred since my birth that could have caused this great love of his to rest upon me. He loved us for his own good pleasure. He willed to love us. And this love brought his mercy upon us. And the doom that was due to us fell upon Christ. On the third day, Jesus Christ rose again. The Father was satisfied. Romans 5.15 says this, But the free gift is not like the transgression, for if by the transgression of the one the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. So again, mercy is being spared that which we rightfully deserve, and grace is being given what we have no right to. Verses 6 and 7 of our text. And raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. The resurrection of Christ guarantees the resurrection of everyone who is in him. 
and to be seated in heavenly places in Christ is to assure us that we are no longer in the realm of Satan, the prince of the power of the air. Salvation is secure. Once saved, always saved. That's right, church. If you are in Christ, your salvation is totally secure. Let's look at this one. John 10. If you want, if you want to turn there, John 10, uh, verses 27 through 29. John 10, verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I'm going to fly through a couple of verses, so don't feel like you have to turn to, 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 to all of them, but... For reference, I'm going to go to Colossians chapter 3, verses 3 through 4. Colossians 3, 3 through 4. For you, have, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Romans 8. 28 through 31. Don't, don't have to turn there, but this is going to be familiar to many of you. Verse 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he... Jesus would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? We have already been made to sit with God in Christ. That is your position now if you are in Christ. And we ought to live our lives accordingly. As I mentioned last week, the ultimate purpose for the salvation of mankind is for the glory of God. God has determined that in the ages to come, he would be glorified by pouring out his love upon us. And all of heaven shall praise his name. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Verses 8 and 9 of our text in Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. There are two religions in the world. There's the religion of human achievement, which comes in countless different forms and is known by, and is known by many different names. And then there is the one and only true religion, the religion of Christianity, the, the religion of divine accomplishment. In all religions, the offense of the deity or deities, in the case of polytheistic religions such as Hinduism, where they serve multiple gods, the, the offense of these deities or the deity is assumed. They understand that there is a god and they rightly judge that they have offended him or them. They see it this way. God is unhappy with you now, so you must appease him. The, the basic doctrinal statement of the religion of human achievement the mind of natural man assumes that he must clean up his act and follow the rules and try to be nice enough or good enough or kind enough to ultimately be spared from whatever fate their false God has for them. 
False religion has billions of people totally deceived. And the world's fine with that. The world will pat you on the back, be supportive of your religion, no matter what it is. Unless your religion is the true religion. If you proclaim the God of the Bible and the Christ of Scripture, you will not be embraced by the world. The only true religion of divine accomplishment recognizes that indeed man has offended a holy God. And this God has revealed himself in detail and by his sovereign providence has preserved the revelation of himself in his word. But he's not only revealed who he is to us, he's revealed who we are. And this is the rub. Sinners in the hands of an angry God, totally dead by nature to the things of God, unable to do any work at all to please him and appease his wrath. In fact, our most righteous acts have been described as filthy rags to him. For all of us, this is Isaiah 64, 6, for all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. So, beloved, remember that man by nature is dead in trespasses and is living according to the course of the world, which is governed by the prince of the power of the air. And remember that this prince had set it in his heart to ascend to the throne of God. He wanted to be the Most High. He wanted to be God. The religious systems of the world cannot stand the true religion because in Christianity, the creature is totally at the mercy of God. Only grace can save us. Unmerited, undeserved, unearned. but it is a gift of God. And Paul, being inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this letter to the church of Ephesus, who started this, this great second chapter by declaring that we all had formerly been controlled by the course of this world, Paul wants to shake off any remaining pieces of false religion that depends on human achievement to appease a deity. So he is a little bit redundant here when he says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. It's grace that saved you. It's grace that provides faith to be saved. It didn't come from you. It was a gift from God. Not as a result of works. It is literally all from beginning to end God's work. So that no one may claim to have even the smallest shred of responsibility for this salvation. We can be slow. So God has made it unmistakably clear. So to our final verse of the day. Ephesians 2 verse 10. For we are his, his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. It is God alone that makes a Christian. It is God alone that regenerates our hearts and makes us alive to Christ. There is no good work that we can do that can appease God. And yet we are saved unto good works. Just as God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world and predestined us according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will, he has predestined the ones that he saves unto good works. Be very careful that your good works are on the right side of the cross of Jesus Christ. 
Good works is an effort to please God and save ourselves or a stench in the nostrils of God. Go back to Gethsemane in your mind when Christ said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Now, we talked about this last week. Christ wasn't asking for God to abandon his eternal plan to save men through the death of his son. He was making it clear to all who would ever hear this account in the garden that there is no other way to satisfy the wrath of holy God. Some have a hard time embracing the Bible's clear teaching on the security of those who are in Christ because they have seen so much apostasy. Someone who makes a profession of faith in Christ but then soon falls away and walks again according to the course of this world. Much could be said about this. Let me just read 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. Now, as we talked about last week, the gospel of Jesus Christ has in many churches been perverted into a different gospel. A gospel that is not the gospel at all, but has been conformed to the course of this world and has taken on features of every other false religion putting the power of salvation into man's hand and attempting to coerce a decision out of him. Raise your hand to receive this salvation. Pray this prayer to receive this salvation. Walk this aisle to the front of the church to receive this salvation. When these acts of men are pointed to as an occurrence of salvation, it should be no surprise when they fall away back to the world from which their raising of a hand, praying a sinner's prayer, or walking an aisle never had the power to save them. But when God saves a sinner, there is no truer statement than this. Once saved, always saved. Beloved, God has chosen. God has chosen God has chosen, God has chosen. In his sovereignty, he has chosen. It is by the grace of God that you have been saved. The grace of God has regenerated your heart, giving you the faith that is needed, the faith that is required for repentance, for belief leading to salvation. This is a gift of God. This is the greatest gift of God. This gift has to be freely bestowed upon us by God himself. And not only that, but he chose us before the world was. Before he said, let there be light, he had chosen us in Christ. The God who spoke the world into existence has decreed in eternity past to save his people. If this message has come to you today, be you here in the congregation or be you on the live stream or be you watching this later on, and you find yourself relying upon some act that you did in the past, raising a hand, walking an aisle, praying a prayer, whatever it was, anything that you're relying upon that you have done, do what is prescribed in Scripture. And second, Corinthians 13, 5. Test yourselves. Test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. Do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? So how can you examine yourself? Do you love Christ? Do you have any love for Christ at all? Do you love his word? If you have any love for his word at all, then fan the flame of that love daily by pressing into scripture. 
Do you need help on how to read his word? On where to start? You can see me after the service. Our pastor will be back in town tonight or tomorrow. He, and he would love nothing more than to shepherd those of his flock as they seek to read the word daily and press into scripture. Do you love Christ? Do you love the brethren? Do you love the people for which Christ died? For who Christ died? If you have any kindling of flame in your heart for his church, then fan that flame as often as possible by gathering regularly with the saints. Not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of son, uh, that it, as, is, that is, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the final day drawing near. We are a called people. We must gather. If you have any questions about the gospel, any questions about my message, anything, please see me after the service. So, Jacob Arminius, he lived from the year 1560 to 1609. He was a Dutch pastor. He was a theologian. His theology is best known for its counter-arguments against the theology of John Calvin. He believed, among other things, that men could initiate salvation by their own works. He believed that salvation could be lost. So those that have followed this theology are commonly referred to as Arminians. Not to be confused with Armenians, who are people from Armenia. So with that, I want to close with this quote from the Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon. I remember the manner in which I learned the doctrines of grace in a single instant. Born, as all of us are by nature, an Arminian, I still believe the old things when I had heard that the old things that I had heard continually from the pulpit, and did not see the grace of God. When I was coming to Christ, I thought I was doing it all myself, and though I sought the Lord earnestly, I had no idea the Lord was seeking me. I do not think the young convert is at first aware of this. I can recall the very day and hour when first I received those truths in my own soul, when they were, as John Bunyan says, burnt into my heart as with a hot iron. And I can recollect how I felt that I had known on a sudden from a babe into a man, that I had grown on a sudden from a babe into a man, that I had made progress in scriptural knowledge through having found once for all the clue to the truth of God. One week night when I was sitting in the house of God, I was not thinking much about the preacher's sermon for I did not believe it. The thought struck me. How did you come to be a Christian? I sought the Lord. But how did you come to seek the Lord? The truth flashed across my mind in a moment. I should not have sought him unless there had been some previous influence in my mind to make me see him. I prayed, thought I, but then I asked myself, how came I to pray? I was induced to pray by reading the scriptures. How came I to read the scriptures? I did read them, but what led me to do so? Then in a moment, I saw that God was at the bottom of it all and that he was the author of my faith. And so the whole doctrine of grace opened up to me. And from that doctrine, I have not departed to this day. And I ascribe to make this my constant confession. I ascribe my change wholly to God. Let's pray. Father, take these truths and seal them to our heart. 
We are hopelessly dependent upon the spirit of grace, God. Sanctify us by your word. Should this message fall upon the ears of anyone who is outside of Christ, Lord, we beg of you to do that which only you can do. Regenerate the heart. By your sovereign decree, Lord, this message falls upon the ears of whosoever ears it falls upon. I've endeavored to cut it straight and cut it true. Lord, and now the rest, the salvation part is up to you. The sanctification part is up to you, Lord. Sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.